Rudyard Kipling Tumai of the Elephants Narrated by Raina Borton I will remember what I was. I am sick of rope and chain. I will remember my old strength and all my forest affairs. I will not sell my back to man for a bundle of sugar cane. I will go out to my own kind and the wood folk in their lairs. I will go out until the day, until the morning break, out to the wind's untamed kiss, the water's clean caress. I will forget my ankle ring and snap my picket stake. I will revisit my lost loves and playmates masterless. Kulanag, which means black snake, had served the Indian government in every way that an elephant could serve it for 47 years. And, as he was fully 20 years old when he was caught, that makes him nearly 70. A ripe age for an elephant. He remembered pushing with a big leather pad on his forehead at a gun stuck in deep mud and that was before the Afghan War of 1842, and he had not then come to his full strength. His mother, Radha Parari, Radha the Darling, who had been caught in the same drive with Kula Nag, told him, before his little milk tusks had dropped out, that elephants who were afraid always got hurt. Kulanag knew that that advice was good. For the first time that he saw a shell burst, he backed, screaming, into a stand of piled rifles, and the bayonets pricked him in all his softest places. So, before he was twenty-five, he gave up being afraid, and so he was the best-loved and the best-looked-after elephant in the service of the government of India. He had carried tents, twelve hundred pounds weight of tents, on the march in Upper India. He had been hoisted into a ship at the end of a steam crane and taken for days across the water and made to carry a mortar on his back in a strange and rocky country very far from India and had seen the Emperor Theodore lying dead in Magdala and had come back again in the steamer, entitled, so the soldiers said, to the Abyssinian War Medal. He had seen his fellow elephants die of cold and epilepsy and starvation and sunstroke up at a place called Ali Musjid ten years later, and afterward he had been sent down thousands of miles south to haul and pile big bulks of teak in the timber yards at Melmain. There he had half killed an insubordinate young elephant who was shirking his fair share of work. After that, he was taken off timber hauling and employed with a few score other elephants who were trained to the business in helping to catch wild elephants among the Garo Hills. Elephants are very strictly preserved by the Indian government. There is one whole department which does nothing else but hunt them and catch them and break them in and send them up and down the country as they are needed for work. Kulanag stood ten fair feet at the shoulders and his tusks had been cut off short at five feet and bound round the ends to prevent them splitting with bands of copper, but he could do more with those stumps than any untrained elephant could do with the real sharpened ones. When, after weeks and weeks of cautious driving of scattered elephants across the hills, the forty or fifty wild monsters were driven into the last stockade, and the big drop gate, made of tree trunks lashed together, Jarred down behind them, Kulanag, at the word of command, would go into that flaring, trumpeting pandemonium 
generally at night, when the flicker of the torches made it difficult to judge distances, and picking out the biggest and wildest tusker of the mob would hammer him and hustle him into quiet while the men on the backs of the other elephants roped and tied the smaller ones. There was nothing in the way of fighting that Kulanag, the old wise black snake, did not know for he had stood up more than once in his time to the charge of the wounded tiger, and the curling up his soft trunk to be out of harm's way had knocked the springing brute sideways in mid-air with a quick sickle cut of his head, that he had invented all by himself, had knocked him over and kneeled upon him with his huge knees till the life went out with a gasp and a howl, and there was only a fluffy striped thing on the ground for Cooler Nag to pull by the tail. Yes, said Big Tumai, his driver, the son of Black Tumai, who had taken him to Abyssinia, and grandson of Tumai of the elephants, who had seen him caught. There is nothing that the black snake fears except me. He has seen three generations of us feed him and groom him, and he will live to see four. He is afraid of me also, said little Tumai, standing up to his full height of four feet, with only one rag upon him. He was ten years old, the eldest son of big Tumai, and, according to custom, he would take his father's place on Kulanag's neck when he grew up, and would handle the heavy iron ancus, the elephant goad that had been worn smooth by his father and his grandfather and his great-grandfather. He knew what he was talking of, for he had been born under Kula Nag's shadow, had played with the end of his trunk before he could walk, had taken him down to water as soon as he could walk, and Kula Nag would no more have dreamed of disobeying his shrill little orders than he would have dreamed of killing him on that day when Big Tumai carried the little brown baby under Kula Nag's tusks and told him to salute his master that was to be. Yes, said little Tumai, he is afraid of me, and he took long strides up to Kula Nag, called him a fat old pig, and made him lift up his feet one after the other. Wah, said little Tumai, thou art a big elephant. And he wagged his fluffy head, quoting his father. The government may pay for elephants, but they belong to us mahouts. When thou art old, Kulanag, there will come some rich Raja, and he will buy thee from the government on account of thy size and thy manners. And then thou wilt have nothing to do but to carry gold earrings in thy ears, and a gold howder on thy back, and a red cloth covered with gold on thy sides, and walk at the head of the processions of the king." Then I shall sit on thy neck, O Kulanag, with a silver ancus, and men will run before us with golden sticks, crying, Room for the king's elephant! That will be good, Kulanag, but not so good as this hunting in the jungles. Oomph, said Big Tumai, thou art a boy, and as wild as a buffalo calf. This running up and down among the hills is not the best government service. I am getting old, and I do not love wild elephants. Give me brick elephant lines, one stall to each elephant, and big stumps to tie them to safely, and flat, broad roads to exercise upon, instead of this come-and-go camping. Uh -huh. The Conpore barracks were good. There was a bazaar close by, and only three hours' work a day. Little Tumai remembered the Conpore elephant lines, and said nothing. 
He very much preferred the camp life and hated those broad, flat roads with the daily grubbing for grass in the forage reserve and the long hours when there was nothing to do except to watch Kula Nag fidgeting in his pickets. What little to my light was to scramble up bridle paths that only an elephant could take, the dip into the valley below, the glimpses of the wild elephants browsing miles away, the rush of the frightened pig and peacock under Kula Nag's feet, the blinding warm rains when all the hills and valleys smoked, the beautiful misty mornings when nobody knew where they would camp that night, the steady, cautious drive of the wild elephants and the mad rush and blaze and hullabaloo of the last night's drive when the elephants poured into the stockade like boulders in a landslide found that they could not get out and flung themselves at the heavy posts only to be driven back by yells and flaring torches and volleys of blank cartridge. Even a little boy could be of use there, and Tumai was as useful as three boys. He would get his torch and wave it and yell with the best. But the really good time came when the driving out began and the keda, that is, the stockade, looked like a picture of the end of the world and men had to make signs to one another because they could not hear themselves speak. Then little Tumai would climb up to the top of one of the quivering stockade posts, his sun-bleached brown hair flying loose all over his shoulders and he looking like a goblin in the torchlight. And as soon as there was a lull, you could hear his high-pitched yells of encouragement to Kulanag above the trumpeting and crashing and snapping of ropes and groans of the tethered elephants. Mail, mail, Kulanag, go on, go on, black snake. Don't do... Give him the tusk. Samalo, Samalo. Careful, careful. Maro, ma. Hit him, hit him. Mind the post. Array, array. Hi, yai, kirare. He would shout. And the big fight between Kulanag and the wild elephant would sway to and fro the Kida, and the old elephant catchers would wipe the sweat out of their eyes and find time to nod to little Tumai, wriggling with joy on the top of the posts. He did more than wriggle. One night he slid down from the post and slipped in between the elephants and threw up the loose end of a rope which had dropped to a driver who was trying to get a purchase on the leg of a kicking young calf. Calves always give more trouble than full-grown animals. Kulanag saw him, caught him in his trunk and handed him up to Big Tumai, who slapped him then and there and put him back on the post. Next morning he gave him a scolding and said, are not good brick elephant lines and a little tent carrying enough that thou must needs go elephant catching on thy own account, little worthless? Now those foolish hunters, whose pay is less than my pay, have spoken to Peterson Shahib of the matter. Little Tumai was frightened. He did not know much of white men, but Peterson Shahib was the greatest white man in the world to him. He was the head of all the Kida operations, the man who caught all the elephants for the government of India and who knew more about the ways of elephants than any living man. What, what will happen? said little Tumai. Happen? The worst that can happen. Peterson Shahib is a madman, 
Else why should he go hunting these wild devils? He may even require thee to be an elephant catcher, to sleep anywhere in these fever-filled jungles, and at last to be trampled to death by the Kida. It is well that this nonsense ends safely. Next week the catching is over, and we of the plains are sent back to our stations. Then we will march on smooth roads and forget all this hunting. But son, I am angry that thou shouldst meddle in the business that belongs to these dirty Assamese jungle folk. Kulanag will obey none but me, so I must go with him to the Kedah. But he is only a fighting elephant, and he does not help to rope them. So I sit at my ease as befits a mahout, not a mere hunter. A mahout, I say, and a man who gets a pension at the end of his service. Is the family of Tumai of the elephants to be trodden underfoot in the dirt of the Kida? Bad one, wicked one, worthless son, go and wash Kulanag and attend to his ears, and see that there are no thorns in his feet, or else Peterson Shahib will surely catch thee and make thee a wild hunter, a follower of elephant's foot tracks, a jungle bear. Bah! Shame! Go! Little Tumai went off without saying a word, but he told Kulanag all his grievances while he was examining his feet. No matter, said little Tumai, turning up the fringe of Kulanag's huge right ear. They have said my name to Peterson Shahib, and perhaps, and perhaps, and perhaps, who knows? Hi! That is a big thorn that I have pulled out. The next few days were spent in getting the elephants together, in walking the newly caught wild elephants up and down between a couple of tame ones to prevent them giving too much trouble on the downward march to the plains, and in taking stock of the blankets and ropes and things that had been worn out or lost in the forest. Peterson Shahib came in on his clever she-elephant, Pudmani. He had been paying off other camps among the hills, for the season was coming to an end, and there was a native clerk sitting at a table under the tree to pay the drivers their wages. As each man was paid, he went back to his elephant and joined the line that stood ready to start. The catchers, and hunters, and beaters, the men of the regular Kedah, who stayed in the jungle year in and year out, sat on the backs of the elephants that belonged to Peterson Shahib's permanent force, or leaned against the trees with their guns across their arms, and made fun of the drivers who were going away, and laughed when the newly caught elephants broke the line and ran about. Big Tumai went up to the clerk with little Tumai behind him, and Mature Appa, the head tracker, said in an undertone to a friend of his, There goes one piece of good elephant stuff at least. Tis a pity to send that young jungle cock to molt in the plains. Now Peterson Shahib had ears all over him, as a man must have who listens to the most silent of all living things, the wild elephant. He turned where he was lying all along on Pudmani's back and said, What is that? I did not know of a man among the plains drivers who had wit enough to rope even a dead elephant. This is not a man, but a boy. He went into the Kadar, at the last drive, and threw Barmawa there the rope, when we were trying to get that young calf with the blotch on his shoulder away from his mother. 
Mature Appa pointed at Little Tumai, and Peterson Shahib looked, and Little Tumai bowed to the earth. He threw a rope. He is smaller than a picket pin. Little one, what is thy name? said Peterson Shahib. Little Tumai was too frightened to speak, but Kulanag was behind him, and Tumai made a sign with his hand, and the elephant caught him up in his trunk and held him level with Pudmani's forehead, in front of the great Peterson Shahib. Then little Tumai covered his face with his hands, for he was only a child, and except where elephants were concerned, he was just as bashful as a child could be. Oh, said Peterson Shahib, smiling underneath his moustache, and why didst thou teach thy elephant that trick? Was it to help thee steal green corn from the roofs of the houses when the ears are put out to dry? Not green corn, protector of the poor, melons, said little Tumai, and all the men sitting about broke into a roar of laughter. Most of them had taught their elephants that trick when they were boys. Little Tumai was hanging eight feet up in the air, and he wished very much that he were eight feet underground. He is Tumai, my son, Shahib, said Big Tumai, scowling. He is a very bad boy, and he will end in jail, Shahib. Of that I have my doubts, said Peterson Shahib. A boy who can face a full Kadar at his age does not end in jails. See, little one, here are four annas to spend on sweetmeats, because thou hast the little head under that great thatch of hair. In time thou mayest become a hunter too. Big Tumai scowled more than ever. Remember, though, that kedars are not good for children to play in, Peter Sen Shahib went on. Must I never go there, Shahib? asked little Tumai with a big gasp. Yes, Peterson Shahib smiled, when thou hast seen the elephants dance. That is the proper time. Come to me when thou hast seen the elephants dance, and then I will let thee go into all the kadars. There was another roar of laughter, for that is an old joke among the elephant catchers, and it means just Never. There are great cleared flat places hidden away in the forests that are called elephants' ballrooms. But even these are only found by accident, and no man has ever seen the elephants dance. When a driver boasts of his skill and bravery, the others say, And when didst thou see the elephants dance? Kulanag put little to my down, and he bowed to the earth again, and went away with his father, and gave the silver four-anna piece to his mother, who was nursing his baby brother, and they all were put up on Kulanag's back, and the line of grunting, squealing elephants rolled down the hill path to the plains. It was a very lively march, on account of the new elephants, who gave trouble at every ford, and needed coaxing or beating every other minute. Big Tumai prodded Kulanag spitefully, for he was very angry, but little Tumai was too happy to speak. Peterson Shahib had noticed him and given him money, so he felt as a private soldier would feel if he had been called out of the ranks and praised by his commander-in-chief. "'What did Peterson Shahib mean by the elephant dance?' he said at last, softly to his mother. Big Tumai heard him and grunted, "'That thou shouldst never be one of these hill buffaloes of trackers. That was what he meant. Oh, you, in front, what is blocking the way?' "'An Assamese driver.' 
two or three elephants ahead, turned round angrily, crying, Bring up Kulanag and knock this youngster of mine into good behaviour. Why should Peterson Sahib have chosen me to go down with you donkeys of the rice fields? Lay your beast alongside, Tumai, and let him prod with his tusks. By all the gods of the hills, these new elephants are possessed, or else they can smell their companions in the jungle. Kulanag hit the new elephant in the ribs and knocked the wind out of him. As Big Tumai said, We have swept the hills of wild elephants at the last catch. It is only your carelessness in driving. Must I keep order along the whole line? Hear him, said the other driver. We have swept the hills. Ho, ho, you are very wise, you plains people. Anyone but a mudhead who never saw the jungle would know that they know that the drives are ended for the season. Therefore, all the wild elephants tonight will, but why should I waste my wisdom on a river turtle? What will they do? Little Tumai called out. Oi, little one, art thou there? Well, I will tell thee, for thou hast a cool head. They will dance, and it behooves thy father, who has swept all the hills of all the elephants, to double-chain his pickets to-night. "'What talk is this?' said Big Tumai. Forty-six years, father and son, we have tended elephants, and we have never heard such moonshine about dances. Yes, but a plainsman who lives in a hut knows only the four walls of his hut.' Well, leave thy elephants unshackled tonight and see what comes. As for their dancing, I have seen the place where, bap pre bap. How many windings has the Dehang River? Here is another ford, and we must swim the calves. Stop still, you behind me there. And in this way, talking and wrangling and splashing through the rivers, they made their first march to a sort of receiving camp for the new elephants, but they lost their tempers long before they got there. Then the elephants were chained by their hind legs to their big stumps of pickets, and extra ropes were fitted to the new elephants, and the fodder was piled before them, and the hill drivers went back to Peterson Sahib through the afternoon light, telling the plane's drivers to be extra careful that night and laughing when the plane's drivers asked the reason. Little Tumai attended to Kulanag's supper and as evening fell, wandered through the camp unspeakably happy in search of a tom-tom. When an Indian's child's heart is full, he does not run about and make a noise in an irregular fashion. He sits down to a sort of revel all by himself, and little Tumai had been spoken to by Peterson Shahib. If he had not found what he wanted, I believe he would have been ill. But the sweetmeat seller in the camp lent him a little tom-tom, a drum beaten with the flat of the hand, and he sat down cross-legged before Kula Nag as the stars began to come out, the tom-tom in his lap, and he thumped, and he thumped, and he thumped, and the more he thought of the great honour that had been done to him, the more he thumped. All alone among the elephant fodder, there was no tune and no words, but the thumping made him happy. The new elephants strained at their ropes and squealed and trumpeted from time to time, and he could hear his mother in the camp hut putting his small brother to sleep with an old, old song about the great god Shiv, who once told all the animals what they should eat. It is a very soothing lullaby, and the first verse says, Shiv, who poured the harvest and made the winds to blow, 
sitting at the doorways of a day long ago, gave to each his portion, food and toil and fate, from the king upon the goody to the beggar at the gate. All things made he, Shiva the preserver, Mahadio, Mahadio, he made all. Thorn for the camel, fodder for the kine, and mother's heart for sleepy head, O little son of mine. Little Tumai came in with a joyous tunk-a-tunk at the end of each verse, till he felt sleepy and stretched himself on the fodder of Kula Nag's side. At last the elephants began to lie down, one after another, as is their custom, till only Kula Nag at the right of the line was left standing up, and he rocked slowly from side to side, his ears put forward to listen to the night wind as it blew very slowly across the hills. The air was full of all the night noises that, taken together, make one big silence. The click of one bamboo stem against the other, the rustle of something alive in the undergrowth, the scratch and squawk of a half-waked bird. Birds are awake in the night much more often than we imagine, and the fall of water ever so far away. Little Tumai slept for some time, and when he waked it was brilliant moonlight, and Kula Nag was still standing up with his ears cocked. Little Tumai turned rustling in the fodder, and watched the curve of his big back against half the stars in heaven. And while he watched, he heard, so far away that it sounded no more than a pinhole of noise pricked through the stillness, the hoot-hoot of a wild elephant. All the elephants in the lines jumped up as if they had been shot, and their grunts at last waked the sleeping Mahouts and they came out and drove the picket pegs with big mallets, and tightened this rope and knotted that till all was quiet. One new elephant had nearly grubbed up his picket, and Big Tumai took off Kula Nag's leg chain and shackled that elephant forefoot to hind foot, but slipped a loop of grass string round Kula Nag's leg and told him to remember that he was tied fast. He knew that he and his father and his grandfather had done the very same thing hundreds of times before. Kula Nag did not answer to the order by gurgling, as he usually did. He stood still, looking out across the moonlight, his head a little raised, and his ears spread like fans up to the great falls of the Garo Hills. Tend to him if he grows restless in the night, said Big Tumai to Little Tumai, and he went into the hut and slept. Little Tumai was just going to sleep too, when he heard the Koya string snap with a little tang and Kula Nag rolled out of his pickets as slowly and as silently as a cloud rolls off the mouth of a valley. Little Tumai pattered after him, barefooted down the road in the moonlight, calling under his breath, Kula Nag, Kula Nag, take me with you, O oh, Kula Nag. The elephant turned, without a sound, took three strides back to the boy in the moonlight, put down his trunk, swung him up to his neck, and almost before little Tumai had settled his knees, slipped into the forest. There was one blast of furious trumpeting from the lines, and then silence shut down on everything, and Kula Nag began to move. Sometimes a tuft of high grass washed along his sides as a wave washes along the sides of a ship, and sometimes a cluster of wild pepper vines would scrape along his back, or a bamboo would creak where his shoulder touched it. But between those times he moved absolutely without any sound, drifting through the thick, 
Garo Forest as though it had been smoke. He was going uphill, but though little Tumai watched the stars in the rifts of the trees, he could not tell in what direction. Then Kulanag reached the crest of the ascent and stopped for a minute, and little Tumai could see the tops of the trees lying all speckled and furry under the moonlight for miles and miles, and the blue-white mist over the river in the hollow. Tumai leaned forward and looked, and he felt that the forest was awake below him, awake and alive and crowded. A big brown fruit-eating bat brushed past his ear, a porcupine's quills rattled in the thicket, and in the darkness between the tree stems he heard a hog bear digging hard in the moist, warm earth and snuffing as it digged. Then the branches closed over his head again, and Kulanag began to go down into the valley, not quietly this time, but as a runaway gun goes down a steep bank, in one rush. The huge limbs moved as steadily as pistons, eight feet to each stride, and the wrinkled skin of the elbow points rustled. The undergrowth on either side of him ripped with a noise like torn canvas, and the saplings that he heaved away right and left with his shoulders sprang back again and banged him on the flank, and great trails of creepers, all matted together, hung from his tusks as he threw his head from side to side and ploughed out of his pathway. Then little Tumai laid himself down close to the great neck, lest a swinging bough should sweep him to the ground, and he wished that he were back in the lines again. The grass began to get squashy, and Kulanag's feet sucked and squelched as he put them down, and the night mist at the bottom of the valley chilled little Tumai. There was a splash and a trample, and the rush of running water, and Kulanag strode through the bed of a river, feeling his way at each step. Above the noise of the water, as it swirled round the elephant's legs, little Tumai could hear more splashing and some trumpeting, both upstream and down. Great grunts and angry snortings, and all the mist about him seemed to be full of rolling, wavy shadows. Ay, he said, half aloud, his teeth chattering. The elephant folk are out tonight. It is the dance, then. Kulanag swashed out of the water, blew his trunk clear, and began another climb. But this time he was not alone, and he had not to make his path. That was made already, six feet wide in front of him, where the bent jungle grass was trying to recover itself and stand up. Many elephants must have gone that way only a few minutes before. Little Tumai looked back, and behind him a great wild tusker, with his little pig's eyes glowing like hot coals, was just lifting himself out of the misty river. Then the trees closed up again, and they went on and up with trumpetings and crashings, and the sound of breaking branches on every side of them. At last, Kulanag stood still between two tree trunks at the very top of the hill. They were part of a circle of trees that grew round an irregular space of some three or four acres, and in all that space, as little Tumai could see, the ground had been trampled down as hard as a brick floor. Some trees grew in the centre of the clearing, but their bark was rubbed away, and the white wood beneath showed all shiny and polished in the patches of moonlight. 
there were creepers hanging from the upper branches, and the bells of the flowers of the creepers, great waxy white things like convolvuluses, hung down fast asleep. But within the limits of the clearing, there was not a single blade of green, nothing but the trampled earth. The moonlight showed it all iron grey, except where some elephants stood upon it, and their shadows were inky black. Little Tumai looked, holding his breath, with his eyes starting out of his head, and as he looked, more and more and more elephants swung out into the open from behind the tree trunks. Little Tumai could only count up to ten, and he counted again and again on his fingers till he lost count of the tens, and his head began to swim. Outside the clearing, he could hear them crashing in the undergrowth as they worked their way up the hillside. But as soon as they were within the circle of the tree trunks, they moved like ghosts. There were white-tusked wild males, with fallen leaves and nuts and twigs lying in the wrinkles of their necks and the folds of their ears. Fat, slow-footed she-elephants, with restless little pinky-black calves only three or four feet high running under their stomachs. Young elephants, with their tusks just beginning to show, and very proud of them. Lanky, scraggy old maid elephants, with their hollow, anxious faces, and trunks like rough bark. Savage old bull elephants, scarred from shoulder to flank, with great wheels and cuts of bygone fights. And the caked dirt of their solitary mud baths dropping from their shoulders. And there was one with a broken tusk, and the marks of the full stroke, the terrible drawing scrape of a tiger's claws on his side. They were standing head to head, or walking to and fro across the ground in couples, or rocking and swaying all by themselves, scores and scores of elephants. Tumai knew that so long as he lay still on Kulanag's neck, nothing would happen to him. For even in the rush and scramble of a Kadar drive, a wild elephant does not reach up with his trunk and drag a man off the neck of a tame elephant. And these elephants were not thinking of men that night. Once they started and put their ears forward when they heard the chinking of a leg iron in the forest. But it was Pudmani, Peterson Shahib's pet elephant, her chain snapped short off, grunting, snuffling up the hillside. She must have broken her pickets and come straight from Peterson Shahib's camp. And little Tumai saw another elephant, one that he did not know, with deep rope galls on his back and breast. He, too, must have run away from some camp in the hills about. At last, there was no sound of any more elephants moving in the forest, and Kulanag rolled out from his station between the trees and went into the middle of the crowd, clucking and gurgling, and all the elephants began to talk in their own tongue and to move about. Still lying down, Little Tumai looked down upon scores and scores of broad backs and wagging ears and tossing trunks and little rolling eyes. He heard the click of tusks as they crossed other tucks by accident and the dry rustle of trunks twined together and the chafing of enormous sides and shoulders in the crowd and the incessant flick and hish of the great tails. Then a cloud came over the moon, and he sat in black darkness. But the quiet, steady hustling and pushing and gurgling went on just the same. He knew that there were elephants all round Kulanag, and that there was no chance of backing him out of the assembly. 
so he set his teeth and shivered. In Kedar, at least there was torchlight and shouting, but here he was all alone in the dark, and once a trunk came up and touched him on the knee. Then an elephant trumpeted, and they all took it up for five or ten terrible seconds. The dew from the trees above spattered down like rain on the unseen backs, and a dull, booming noise began. Not very loud at first, and little Tumai could not tell what it was. But it grew and grew, and Kulanag lifted up one forefoot and then the other and brought them down on the ground. One, two, one, two, as steadily as trip hammers. The elephants were stamping all together now, and it sounded like a war drum beaten on the mouth of a cave. The dew fell from the trees till there was no more left to fall, and the booming went on, and the ground rocked and shivered, and little Tumai put his hands up to his ears to shut out the sound. But it was all one gigantic jar that ran through him, this stamp of hundreds of heavy feet on the raw earth. Once or twice he could feel Kulanag and all the others surge forward a few strides, and the thumping would change to the crushing sound of juicy green things being bruised. But in a minute or two the boom of feet on hard earth began again. A tree was creaking and groaning somewhere near him. He put out his arm and felt the bark, but Kulanag moved forward, still tramping, and he could not tell where he was in the clearing. There was no sound from the elephants except once, when two or three little calves squeaked together. Then he heard a thump and a shuffle, and the booming went on. It must have lasted fully two hours, and little Tumai ached in every nerve, but he knew by the smell of the night air that the dawn was coming. The morning broke in one sheet of pale yellow behind the green hills, and the booming stopped with the first ray, as though the light had been an order. Before little Tumai had got the ringing out of his ears, before even he had shifted his position, there was not an elephant in sight except Kulanag, Pudmani, and the elephant with the rope gulls, and there was neither sign nor rustle nor whisper down the hillsides to show where the others had gone. Little Tumai stared again and again. The clearing, as he remembered it, had grown in the night. More trees stood in the middle of it, but the undergrowth and the jungle grass at the sides had been rolled back. Little Tumai stared once more. Now he understood the trampling. The elephants had stamped out more room, had stamped the thick grass and juicy cane to trash, the trash into slithers, the slithers into tiny fibres, and fibres into hard earth. Wah, said little Tumai, and his eyes were very heavy. Kulanag, my lord, let us keep by Pudmoni and go to Peterson Shahib's camp, or I shall drop from thy neck. The third elephant watched the two go away, snorted, wheeled round, and took his own path. He may have belonged to some little native king's establishment, fifty or sixty or a hundred miles away. Two hours later, as Peterson Shahib was eating early breakfast, his elephants, who had been double-chained that night, began to trumpet, and Pudmani mired to the shoulders with Kulanag. Very footsore, shambled into the camp. Little Tumai's face was grey and pinched, and his hair was full of leaves and drenched with dew. But he tried to salute Peterson Shahib, and cried faintly, 
the dance, the elephant dance. I have seen it, and I die. As Kula Nag sat down, he slid off his neck in a dead faint. But since native children have no nerves worth speaking of, in two hours he was lying very contentedly in Peterson Shahib's hammock with Peterson Shahib's shooting coat under his head and a glass of warm milk, a little brandy, with a dash of quinine inside him. And while the old hairy, scared hunters of the jungles sat three deep before him, looking at him as though he were a spirit, he told his tale in short words as a child will, and wound up with, Now, if I lie in one word, send men to see, and they will find that the elephant folk have trampled down more room in their dance room, and they will find ten and ten and many times ten tracks leading to that dance room. They made more room with their feet. I have seen it. Kula Nag took me, and I saw. Also, Kula Nag is very leg-weary. Little to my lay back and slept all through the long afternoon and into the twilight. And while he slept, Peterson Sahib and Mature Appa followed the track of the two elephants for fifteen miles across the hills. Peterson Sahib had spent eighteen years in catching elephants, and he had only once before found such a dance place. Mature Appa had no need to look twice at the clearing to see what had been done there, or to scratch with his toe in the packed, rammed earth. The child speaks truth, said he. All this was done last night, and I have counted seventy tracks crossing the river. See, Sahib, where Pudmani's leg iron cut back the bark of that tree. Yes, she was there too. They looked at one another, and up and down, and they wondered, for the ways of elephants are beyond the wit of any man, black or white, to fathom. Forty years and five, said Mature Appa, have I followed my lord, the elephant, but never have I heard that any child of man had seen what this child has seen. By all the gods of the hills, it is, what can we say? And he shook his head. When they got back to camp, it was time for the evening meal. Peterson Shahib ate alone in his tent, but he gave orders that the camp should have two sheep and some fowls, as well as a double ration of flour and rice and salt, for he knew that there would be a feast. Big Tumai had come up hot-foot from the camp in the plains to search for his son and his elephant, and now that he had found them, he looked at them as though he were afraid of them both. And there was a feast by the blazing campfires in front of the lines of picketed elephants, and little Tumai was the hero of it all, and the big brown elephant catchers, the trackers and drivers and ropers, and the men who know all the secrets of breaking the wildest elephants, passed him from one to the other, and they marked his forehead with blood from the breast of a newly killed jungle cock, to show that he was a forester, initiated and free of all the jungles. At last, when the flames died down, and the red light of the logs made the elephants look as though they had been dipped in blood too, Mature Appa, the head of all the drivers of all the Geddas, Mature Appa, Peterson Shahib's other self, who had never seen a made road in forty years, Mature Appa, who was so great that he had no other name than Mature Appa, leapt to his feet, with little Tumai held high in the air above his head, and shouted, Listen, my brothers, listen, too, you my lords in the lines there, 
for I, mature Appa, am speaking. This little one shall no more be called little Tumai, but Tumai of the elephants, as his great-grandfather was called before him. What never man has seen, he has seen through the long night, and the favour of the elephant folk and of the gods of the jungles is with him. He shall become a great tracker. He shall become greater than I, even I, mature Appa. He shall follow the new trail and the stale trail and the mixed trail with a clear eye. He shall take no harm in the Gedda when he runs under their bellies to rope the wild tuskers. And if he slips before the feet of the charging bull elephant, the bull elephant shall know who he is and shall not crush him. Aye, aye, my lords in the chains, he whirled up the line of pickets. Here is the little one that has seen your dances in your hidden places, the sight that never man saw. Give him honour, my lords. Salom, Caro, my children. Make your salute to Tumai of the elephants. Gunga of Pershed. Aha! Hira Gudj. Bershi Gudj. Kuta Gudj. Aha! Pudmoni, thou hast seen him at the dance, and thou too, Kulanag, my pearl among elephants. Aha! Together! To Tumai of the elephants, Baro. And at the last wild yell, the whole line flung up their trunks till the tips touched their foreheads and broke out into the full salute. The crashing trumpet peal that only the Viceroy of India hears. The Salamat of the Kadar. But it was all for the sake of little Tumai, who had seen what never man had seen before, the dance of the elephants at night, and alone in the heart of the Garrow Hills. Shiv and the Grasshopper The song that Tumai's mother sang to the baby. Shiv, who poured the harvest and made the winds to blow, sitting at the doorways of a day long ago, gave to each his portion food and toil and fate, from the king upon the guddy to the beggar at the gate. All things made he, Shiva the preserver, Mahadio, Mahadio, he made all, thorn for the camel, fodder for the kine, and mother's heart of sleepy head, O oh, little son of mine, wheat he gave to rich folk, millet to the poor, broken scraps for holy men that beg from door to door, battle to the tiger, carrion to the kite, and rags and bones to wicked wolves without the wall at night. Nought he found too lofty, none he saw too low, Pabati beside him watched them come and go, Thought to cheat her husband, turning shift to jest, Stole the little grass up her and hid it in her breast. So she tricked him, shiver the preserver, Mahadio, Mahadio, turn and see, Tall are the camels, heavy are the kine, But this was least of little things, O little son of mine. When the door was ended, laughingly she said, Master of a million mouths is not one unfed. Laughing, Shiv made answer, all have had their part, even he, the little one, hidden neath thy heart. From her breast she plucked it, Parbati, the thief, saw the least of little things, gnawed a new-grown leaf, saw and feared and wondered, making prayer to Shiv, who hath surely given meat to all that live. All things made he, Shiva the preserver, Mahadio, Mahadio, he made them all. Thorn for the camel, fodder for the kine, 
and mother's heart for sleepyhead, O little son of mine.